Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mayer, for this uh, kind introduction. Um, my only disclosure is that I, even though I'm giving a talk on anesthesia, I'm a neurologist. I'm not an anesthesiologist. So this topic became of uh, extreme relevance, you know, in the wake of all the new trials, the five, you know, the big fat or big fat five, like you call them, um, and and the recent, you know, Dawn trial. What do we do with a patient who presents to us with an LVO and uh, who needs to undergo, you know? needs to go straight to angio to undergo thrombectomy. Um, what, do we, what do we use you know, in terms of sedation uh, in order to, well, first of all, keep the patient safe still you know, on the angio uh, table, uh, but also minimize the time that you're actually getting the patient uh, uh, you know, sedated and achieving the, you know, the optimal or you know, the fastest time to growing puncture. So, very classically, you get a phone call, obviously, at 2 or 3 a.m. of this patient who's, you know, uh, got an NIHO scale of 22. He's in your ED. And uh, you need to activate, you know, a stroke call code or stroke alert. Um, and uh, so, you know, the resident gets busy with calling uh, the neurointerventionalist who's on call, uh, but also uh, the, the neuro ICU to let them know that there's a patient that will be coming after angio. You have, you know, the, the, to book the angio suite, et cetera. And inevitably, the question comes, you know, what do we do, you know, to sedate the patient? Are you going to intubate the patient, put them down because, well, it makes sense, you know, the patient needs to really remain still, you know? Um, or do you do what we call MAC? And MAC is Monitored Anesthesia Care, also known as conscious sedation. So I'll be using the two terms pretty interchangeably. Um, so in some cases, really, it's a slam dunk, right? It's, the patient is extremely agitated, you know, those bad, you know, right parietal strokes, you know, where the patient loses, you know, uh, uh, pretty much sight of, you know, what's going on with them um, and, uh, and really needs to be, you know, to, to have the big guns, you know, used in order to uh, sedate them. Or the patient who's aspirating because they're vomiting, and so that's a risk, you know, for aspiration pneumonia. Or again, you know, the patient who basically um, has lost brainstem reflexes, uh, to the point where they're not protecting their airway. It's a slam dunk. You're going to potentially, you know, just intubate and uh, put them under general anesthesia. But in most cases, as a matter of fact, we, we don't know. We could go either way, really. So there's really real clinical equipoise. Now, why is this, you know, topic such an important topic? Well, first of all, um, Intubation, sedation, you know, is not an easy matter on the brain. A brain that's suffering, you know, from a major stroke as an LVO, uh, uh, or even a smaller, you know, occlusion in a more distal branch is really relying on collateral flow uh, and, and really drops in the blood pressure related to sedation or the act of intubating someone can actually be very detrimental and expand that zone of infarct and that penumbra that we are so eager to restore, right? Um, so the take home messages really from this you know, talk is that, well, in the past we used to think that general anesthesia was, was detrimental and that um, most, actually, most institutions will try to, you know, if they can, if they have the capability to go with uh, conscious sedation. Um, but recent RCTs, uh, actually we only have uh, two uh, to date, you know, weirdly enough, uh, suggest that there's really no superiority of one modality versus the other regarding early neurological improvement after a thrombectomy. But all of those studies have tremendous limitations, and uh, even the RCTs, um, and, and this is why we have still the need to, uh, to, to, uh, to perform a multi-center RCT to address which modality is, is best. Um, and, and obviously, at the end of the day, it really uh, boils down to tailoring you know, your approach to your individual patient and be you know, cognizant of what are the limitations uh, uh, and the resources that you have available to you, right? So, like I said, until very recently, general anesthesia was thought to be the bad guy. Um, it caused more, you know, uh, hemodynamic instability because it dropped, you know, your blood pressure, caused more episodes of hypotension, uh, also led to uh, uh, potentially as a, as a result, you know, to more morbidity um, uh, at 90 days, uh, as well as, as uh, mortality, and, um, and, and all the complications related to intubation, you know, like uh, getting an, a pneumonia or a ventilator-associated pneumonia, et cetera. So there are no RCTs to explore the comparison. 
And as a matter of fact, the most recent guidelines that we have regarding uh, early th you know, thrombectomy uh, in patients with acute ischemic stroke came from 2015 as a revision of the 2013. And it stipulates that it might be reasonable to actually consider con conscious sedation over general anesthesia in uh, thrombectomies. So procedural hypotension is bad. And we know that it makes sense. And this is actually a paper that was just published in AJNR. Um, and which shows that basically a drop in blood pressure will inevitably you know, cause uh, a, a detriment to, to the brain and to the 90-day uh, outcome or good outcome, which in this case was uh, quantified using an MRS of zero to two, so functional independence at 90 days. Um, and you can see that across the whole gamut of NI choke scale severities, uh, really when you drop your map uh, below uh, a certain level, uh, which is not really quantified, where we don't know exactly what, and it very likely uh, varies you know, depending on the patient and the baseline you know, blood pressure of that patient, but you will cause uh, uh, greater morbidity. And as a matter of fact, you are four times more likely to, uh, to have a bad outcome, so an MRS of greater than two, if you, were, uh, if, if you had uh, a, a, at least a 10 millimeter of mercury drop in your map. There was a meta-analysis that actually came up uh, last year that looked at 18 uh, different studies and that basically showed worse neurological outcomes with general anesthesia. Um, and, uh, uh, and there were more you know, intraprocedural hypotension episodes, uh, almost you know, an uh, odds ratio of 1.4. Um, you almost doubled your 90-day mortality, and you halved your functional independence at 90 days. The problem with those studies are, uh, and I don't have all the points here uh, shown, but first of all, most of those studies were retrospective. Um, second, there was a huge selection bias because those studies usually, in, in those studies, the worst uh, uh, strokes actually received the general anesthesia. And the third point was that most of those studies were done in the pre standard retriever uh, era. So in this uh, forest plot here, you can see uh, highlighted in, in green on, on the top is the studies that uh, basically uh, included the pre-stent you know, uh, studies. And uh, the bottom half is those that uh, pertain to the stent retriever era. To the left of the vertical line that crosses the one is uh, uh, studies that basically uh, favored the use of uh, uh, MAC or conscious sedation versus the ones on the right that uh, favored general anesthesia. And you can see, if I had a pointer, I could show you. Well, th there are the, the, I want to point your attention to the red circles here. These are the only two studies that actually showed that there was a, a better outcome using conscious sedation. Now, one, one of them crosses you know, the one, and so it's not necessarily very you know, statistically significant, but it, it, there's a trend. The other one is definitely definitely shows better outcome with you know, uh, conscious sedation in terms of good neurological outcome, meaning an MRS of zero to two at 90 days, okay? And um, interestingly enough, those are the only two studies that were RCTs. The others are all retrospective. Uh, and I want to point, uh, I want to discuss uh, just a little bit more about one of those studies, which is uh, appropriately called Siesta, and basically um, was uh, performed in Germany. Uh, it's a single center study uh, that enrolled 150 patients and randomized them between general anesthesia and conscious sedation. And their primary outcome looked at 90 day, um, uh, actually, I'm sorry, looked at uh, early neurological improvement at 24 hours. And that was using a delta NIH choke scale. So NIH choke scale at 24 hours minus the NIH choke scale on admission. Um, and their secondary outcome were uh, more, uh, mortality at 90 days, morbidity at 90 days, as well as feasibility and other metrics. So the, the bottom line of this uh, uh, paper was that there's actually no difference in the two arms of treatment regarding early neurological improvement, meaning an, uh, um, uh, at, night, at 24 hours. So comparing the NIH stroke scale at 24 hours and on admission. And if you look at all the subgroup uh, that they analyzed, there was really also no difference, okay? Including the severity of the NIH stroke scale, uh, the gender, whether or not they got TPA, and how bad their stroke looked radiographically based on the aspect score. Uh, using the grotto bars here, you can actually see uh, that at 90 day, 
um, when they did their secondary outcome, the MRS of six, which equals death, was actually the same between the two uh, arms. And um, if you look at the three first uh, bars, uh, the lighter blues, um, you can see the MRS of zero to two, which is the functional independence. And uh, there is a statistical uh, sig uh, significance uh, or, or statistically significant improvement with uh, patient in the general anesthesia group, meaning that much more or much more patients did better at 90 days uh, and were more functionally independent uh, if they had received general anesthesia. Interestingly, because this is in contradiction to what the other retrospective studies had shown before. So, uh, and specifically, there was actually no difference in the rate of recanalization. Uh, door to reperfusion time, which is extremely important, even though there was maybe longer door, door to puncture time with general anesthesia. Um, there was very importantly no more episodes of hypotension using general anesthesia compared to conscious sedation. And uh, the length of stay, uh, whether IC or total stay, was the same. And in terms of iatrogenic complications related to the procedure itself, like vessel rupture or ICH, there was actually no difference. The common and you know, common sense complications that you would expect from each uh, modality is that GA um, was uh, uh, fraught with more hypothermia, hypothermic episodes, obviously delayed extubation, ventilator-associated pneumonia, pneumothoraces, and all the complications related to intubation. Whereas MAC, um, because you're lightly sedating the patient, there was more risk of having patient movement, uh, but this didn't seem to necessarily uh, untowardly affect the patient. The problems with those RCTs, uh, the two RCTs, is that, well, first of all, it's very limited generalizability because those um, studies were performed in uh, centers that were highly skilled, that had really high uh, uh, and skilled you know, neuroanesthesia uh, uh, teams as well as neurointerventionalists. Um, they, as, a, as a result, they had very low rates of procedural hypotension. And their uh, door to growing puncture time was under 10 minutes, which is fairly remarkable. Um, and uh, um, th the other problem uh, was that there was a high crossover rate, uh, meaning um, basically those patients who started off with conscious sedation and then had to be converted because of X, Y, or Z you know, during the procedure to a general anesthesia, uh, you had worse outcome because you know you you have to analyze those patients with an intention to treat analysis and, uh, and, and more delays related to having to convert from one sedation to the other and intubating the patient was probably nefarious for, uh, for the MAC uh, uh, arm. Um, it was a 15% crossover compared to less than 3% in all the other retrospective uh, studies that were analyzed in that meta-analysis. And as I said, Problems also with generalizability came from the fact that these were single center studies and that they usually had more experience with GA. So my final recommendation is, well, unfortunately we do not have really good and strong evidence to date to suggest or support the use of one anesthesia modality versus the other. However, since we thought you know, before that general anesthesia was you know, deleterious and people try to shy away from it and use conscious sedation, there is more recent data and stronger data to support that it might actually not be the case and the two might actually be very you know, similar. Um, and so, so we, we do need obviously uh, stronger data and, and multi-center randomized controlled trials in order to address the topic. But in the meantime, it's really important to look at your patient clinically Okay, what do you think the patient will need and you know, require uh, before the procedure starts? Um, and obviously, what are your hospital resources capabilities in terms of, you know, first of all, the anesthesia team, the neurointerventionalist, and your capability to perform neuromonitoring? Thank you very much.